Uh, booster vaccines in general are needed when uh, immunity has waned to the extent that uh, additional uh, boosts are, get, are needed uh, via additional shots of the vaccine to, in order to increase uh, the levels of immunity. My name is uh, Dr. Lim Sin Hong. I'm a scientist and a venture capital investor. I'm currently an assistant managing director at uh, Bigger's Venture Partners, which is a global deep tech and life science VC investment firm. I started and I run the Silicon Valley office and I oversee our life science investment practice. I'm also a board director at Emergex Vaccines, which is a UK company developing groundbreaking T cell vaccines that aim to provide safe and durable immunity against multiple viruses including the many variants and strains of SARS-CoV-2. There are three main types of vaccines that are currently available under WHO emergency use authorization. The first is the mRNA vaccines. These are made by Pfizer, BioNTech and uh, Moderna. Uh, these typically involve injecting genetic instructions contained in fatty droplets that tell cells to make the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Uh, this spike protein then gets displayed on the surface of cells and teaches the immune system to recognize the spike protein. There are no other mRNA vaccines approved for use in humans. Uh, the second type of uh, vaccine that's available are the viral vector vaccines that are made, for instance, by AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. These involve the use of adenoviruses, which is a different type of virus that also causes the common cold, to de also deliver genetic instructions to make the spike protein. There are actually currently no other viral vector vaccines approved for use in humans as well. Lastly, inactivated virus vaccines are also available that are made by Sinopharm and Sinovac. And these comprise SARS-CoV-2 viruses that are killed using chemicals and injected together with immune boosters. Inactivated viruses have been used for vaccinations for a long time with varying success. As I said previously, the most ideal COVID-19 would help to eradicate disease by providing robust and durable immunity in a cost-effective and affordable as well as accessible manner. And all the different first-gen vaccines have their pros and cons, but on the bright side, many of them still seem very effective in preventing severe disease and death. On the other hand, none of the current first-gen vaccines seem capable of eradicating the, the, the disease as the data shows that they have reduced ability to protect against infection by various SARS-CoV-2 variants. However, they have been very helpful in buying time for the world to develop more ideal vaccines. And probably the biggest issue with the first-gen vaccines is that they're focused on just the spike protein which is highly prone to mutation without affecting the rest of the virus. As a result of these mutations, the criminal virus has been able to escape the, the police and the witnesses and evade immunity from the first-gen vaccines. So taking our lessons from the eradicating vaccines such as smallpox and measles vaccines, the most ideal COVID-19 vaccines will likely be able to train a broad set of strong police killer T-cells against parts of SARS-CoV-2 that don't change so much. For example, the uh, so-called nucleoprotein of the virus. And this will enable them to provide robust and durable immunity. But just to give you an example, I mean, the study from uh, Professor Antonio Bertoletti's group in Duke and US and Singapore, it showed that uh, killer T cells that recognize SARS could still be found 17 years, 17 years after sickness in 2003, which shows how long-lived these immune cells can be. So these SARS T cells could even recognize SARS-CoV-2 protein parts which shows you again how robust T-cell immunity can be. The best COVID-19 vaccine would be one that eradicates diseases. Think about all, all this in the context of how long COVID-19 vaccines can, can last. When we consider vaccine effectiveness, we look at two outcomes at least. First of all, it's protection against infection. Second is protection against severe disease and death. And, and really, the situation is literally uh, changing as we speak. But I would say that the latest global data suggests that the first-gen vaccines are unfortunately no longer protecting as well against infection. Uh, immunity is starting to wane at around six to eight months after the second dose. Um, and this effect seems to be most obvious in uh, the elderly, uh, who are also among the first batch of people to get vaccinated.
However, the uh, studies from Singapore show that vaccinated people who get infected still seem to clear the virus more rapidly and the vaccine still seems to be very effective at preventing severe COVID-19 and deaths, though effectiveness has declined a bit in that regard as well. You know, there are updated versions of the first-gen vaccines that are being tested, as well as uh, different modalities and methods of delivery. But again, actually most of them still appear to be focused on the spike protein and antibody shields that would need updating every time a new variant or strain emerges. It's kind of like the seasonal flu vaccine. Right? And this buys time, but we then need to constantly come up with new vaccines every time a new strain or variant of concern emerges. Again, I'm most excited about T cells that have the potential to eradicate the disease by training the immune system to recognize parts of the virus that don't change. And these could possibly provide more stronger and long-term immunity. And I actually think these could be complementary and boost antibody-based treatments and antibody-focused vaccines as well. I actually believe that the leader in the space is a company called Emergex Vaccines that's based in Oxford in the UK. They have a groundbreaking platform of T-cell priming vaccines with a potential so-called pan-coronavirus vaccine. And since they focus on killer T-cells, they don't interfere with prior or future antibody-focused vaccination or treatments. And it's highly unlikely that there will be any negative inter-vaccine reactions because of limited overlap in the vaccine antigens. They've shown in preclinical models already that uh, their vaccine candidate is able to provide robust protection against multiple SARS strains. So it gives me hope that it could provide uh, protection against SARS-2, SARS-3, and SARS-4 and, and, and beyond. They have found that their T-cell vaccine targets remain unaffected by mutations in the viral variants. And importantly, their vaccine candidate can be manufactured cost-effectively at scale and is designed to be stored at room temperature and delivered conveniently in microneedle patches. This could make a big impact in vaccine access for developing countries. COVID-19 is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. It's the disease caused by the virus. So, but when SARS-CoV-2 infects someone, it gets into their cells and makes actually thousands of copies of itself. So it actually causes disease as a swarm, right? So this is a messy process and there's a potential for mistakes or mutations to be made in the genetic code every time the virus replicates. And so like many RNA viruses, SARS-CoV-2 doesn't cause disease as an army of identical clones, but rather as a swarm of closely related mutant viruses. Most of the time, these mutations are small and irrelevant, and some may even disadvantage the virus. But some of the viruses may contain mutations that help the virus better infect people or evade the immune system. So for instance, they may contain mutations in the spike protein that render them no longer recognizable by the antibody shield. And that is why it's preferable actually for vaccines to contain more proteins than just the spike, since it is less likely that there will be mutations in the viruses that render all the proteins unrecognizable. So the larger the swarm, the more mutant viruses there are. And at the same time, the immune system exerts a pressure that selects for mutants that can evade it. The variants have emerged in places with lots of infection cases, and are also believed to have emerged in people with poor immunity, whose bodies try to fight, but they cannot eradicate the virus. And instead, this selects for the strongest ones that survive and get transmitted. Now, throughout the course of the pandemic, actually scientists have found thousands of variants circulating, but about four of them have been indicated as variants of concern of VOCs. And uh, these virus variants uh, of concern are ones that are more easily transmitted or they may cause more severe disease and evade immunity from vaccination. Currently, the most prominent VOC, as, as we all know, I think is the uh, Delta variant, which accounts for almost all cases worldwide. Now. I think Delta is by far the most concerning one the most famous one, there are others with, which is, uh, you know, which have other Greek alphabets as well. Alpha, Alpha, Beta, Theta, Eta. Uh, but seriously, Delta uh, is the one that we are most concerned about because uh, it is remarkably infectious, right? We find that uh, it is able to transmit actually with just one to three viruses, uh, showing how infectious it can be.
vaccine effectiveness is affected by two things. Right? First of all, the nature of the virus and its ability to mutate and evade immunity, and the level and quality of immunity induced by the vaccine. And the fact is, vaccine breakthrough infections can happen. Even at its best, the, the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine was 95% effective in clinical trials, meaning that if 100 vaccinated people were exposed to an infectious uh, case, five of these people could still catch symptomatic COVID-19. And that protection has been reduced as uh, vaccine-induced immunity has declined and variants continue to emerge that evade even the best vaccine-induced immunity. But again, as I mentioned, uh, the data from Singapore suggests that even if vaccinated people clear the virus more quickly. And data from large studies in all the different countries still shows that vaccinated people are much less likely to suffer from severe or fatal COVID-19, even in the face of the surge of the Delta variant. So you know, everyone will have to do their own risk-benefit analysis, but the RNA vaccines have been successful and continue to be successful at reducing severe disease and death, with the strongest effects seen for those in high-risk groups. Just for example, uh, the unvaccinated elderly are more than eight times as likely to experience severe COVID-19 than the vaccinated. Personally, I have advised my parents who are above 60 to get vaccinated. For those who are below 50, vaccination still reduces severe disease and death. However, this is balanced with the increased risk of side effects such as heart inflammation and life-threatening blood clotting. Getting vaccinated, especially for high-risk groups, has generally meant a lower likelihood of severe and fatal COVID-19. Um, it has resulted in a great reduction in hospital and ICU admissions as well as deaths. So the benefits have been personal as well as for public health since hospitals are not overwhelmed. Someone who is immune to COVID-19 does not develop any sickness even if they are exposed to the virus. However, depending on the level of immunity, they may still carry and transmit the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Again, so I think it's useful to differentiate between SARS-CoV-2, the virus, and the disease it causes, which is COVID-19. Even a fully immune person may carry some low levels of SARS-CoV-2 virus upon exposure, but these levels may not get high enough to be transmitted, nor cause COVID-19 disease. Yeah, great question, and uh, one that many people are asking all over the world, particularly as we face uh, limitations in the supply of vaccines. Importantly, various clinical trials are being run, and the data that we have seen from completed studies does suggest that mixing different vaccines can boost vaccine immunity. This may become a possibility in the very near future. Uh, there's evidence uh, suggesting that it can boost uh, vaccine immunity and can be effective, but uh, this is not. there's no authorization provided by the official bodies like the WHO or the FDA for that matter. Because of issues with vaccine access. So uh, booster vaccines in general are needed when uh, immunity has waned to the extent that uh, additional uh, boosts are, are needed uh, via additional shots of the vaccine to in order to increase uh, the levels of immunity. And uh, you know, studies have shown and even there's real world evidence, uh, for instance, uh, from Israel, showing that uh, you know, levels of antibodies can indeed be increased by giving a third shot of the RNA vaccine. But whether or not this is really necessary for those that are not immunocompromised uh, or not in high risk groups uh, remains a contentious question. Oh yeah, so herd immunity uh, comes about when the virus finds it difficult to spread from person to person. Um, possibly because uh, enough of the population, or the so-called herd, uh, has developed immunity, usually because of previous infection or vaccination. As a result, the whole herd becomes protected, and not just those who are immune. So the more contagious a disease is, the greater the, pop the proportion of the population that needs to be immune to the, to the disease to stop its spread. For COVID-19, there are two main paths to herd immunity, infection, and vaccines. But given how infectious the Delta variant is and the challenges around achieving higher vaccination coverage, it now seems uh, mathematically impossible to achieve herd immunity with the current first-gen vaccines. This really heightens the urgency of finding next-gen vaccines that are more effective in providing immunity across different strains, like those perhaps from Emergex, and coupled with various non-pharmaceutical interventions as well. I think factually, millions of people have now been in, injected or have been administered with the vaccines and uh, most of them have completed 
their uh, vaccination schedules. To date, we have seen that uh, it is it's very safe. There are in especially in, in some younger groups, uh, uh, there have been reports of various side effects such as uh, heart inflammation as well as uh, life-threatening blood clotting. clotting. Uh, but otherwise, in general, uh, this has been pretty safe. What we don't know is the safety profile in the long term. And so this is something that requires longer term observation to really assess. And hence, this goes back to my comment earlier uh, about doing sort of everyone needing to do their own risk benefit analysis in deciding whether or not to take the vaccines. It's not that children below 12 are not able to, right? uh, but rather that uh, uh, the clinical trials being conducted in, in children um, is uh, incomplete and much smaller in scale. So as a matter of precaution, it's generally not recommended that children take it. And this goes back to the point earlier as well, that you said that because the longer term safety data uh, is not available, when the authorities and, and parents worldwide consider the risk, the balance of risk and benefits, uncertainty around the longer term safety, balance with the fact that, uh, you know, children in general, first of all, uh, seem at much lower risk of developing symptomatic COVID-19 and a extremely low risk of developing severe and fatal COVID-19. Uh, the risk seems to outweigh the benefits in those cases. And hence, uh, I think authorities all the world are still um, holding back in terms of recommending a vaccination for people, uh, children uh, aged below 12. Right. But for, there's enough evidence to suggest that it's safe and effective for pregnant ladies. So the trials that have been conducted to date suggest that it's safe for pregnant ladies. Um, and, you know, the antibodies that they produce in response to the vaccine uh, could potentially be transmitted from mother to child as well. And, could have a protective effect in that instance, but it's different. It's a different story from uh, uh, sort of a direct injection of the vaccine into the child. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for your regular dose of Asian health information.